And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. He is known as the, 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 leading, voice in, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. As well as, as well as a man who may have dabbled into a few comics here, here and there. And most recently is, is funding the Cosmic Warrior on, Indie, on Indiegogo, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only John De La Rose. How are you doing today, man? Hail, Mildra. Hail, hail. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, it, it's, it's going good. I'm just, count, I'm just counting the days until winter happens. Um, which, given where you are, I, would be a relatively foreign concept. I've never heard of winter. <laughs> What's that mean? Uh, you've heard, you've heard of winter. It's just less summer. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, Those I, freezing nights of sixty degrees. I just can't handle it. <laughs> sixty degrees is what I'm dealing with now. We can, this is this is the good stuff. <laughs> but I. Although to be fair, I'm in a place where I'm, in a, I'm surrounded by forest, and anyone will tell you forests only care about two seasons: summer and winter. They don't ca they don't care about what I call Goldilocks weather. All right. Um, but I'm I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure come January you'll be you'll you'll be still out in the, you'll be selling a t-shirt and sunglasses. Probably I might I might not have shorts on at the time though. Might might switch to pants. So. I only wear shorts when I'm swimming. Mm -hmm. uh, so the last time last time I had you on, we had we had talked about um, Deus Volt, which congratulations on how well that turned out. Um, Thank you very much. So when it comes to the co when it comes to the Cosmic Warrior, um, was this an idea that you had in the back burner for a while, or or was the inspiration path for it a little bit more recent? Um, this one I actually had done for a long time. I think I actually wrapped up all the art on this back in March. And, uh, we came out with the first couple issues of it last year. And then the third one, finally, so this is a collected edition, uh, that basically my next comic is not ready for crowdfunding just yet in that. I always like to get my books done before I start crowdfunding. That way there's no, uh, you know, super long delays in waiting for things. It's a little different in the COVID world now, you know, trying to wait for printers and things like that. But uh, I, I, I like to have things to where people will be able to get it within a few months of their backing so that they're still excited about the book. I mean, if you can't get the book out till a year or two later, you know, people might forget about it. They might forget about you. And I, I want to be able to just come out with new stories, you know, almost quarterly, just make people happy with these great books. So uh, I had this one completely done and just kind of in the can. My next one, which is called Overmind, another science fiction graphic novel, is not ready yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, uh, I need to get something out to my backers so that they can continue to enjoy you know, this new brand of uh, pulp and fantasy fiction that I'm putting out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Cosmic Warrior made sense. I uh, just needed to grab a cover for it real quick for the graphic novel. We got the guy from Downcast, which is one of my favorite comics out there right now, to do the cover. And, uh, and then I just uh, put it up real quick. And since this is done, and I've already had these stories out there in single issue form, I'm just running this for two weeks. I'm just going to deliver it real quick. Uh, like I said, this is kind of like a stopgap uh, between this and the next one because this has been out for a while. Now, the good news is, as I was about to go to Indiegogo with this, I actually won the N3F award for best comic for this. So actually, this is the second award I've won for my writing. And uh, yeah, the Cosmic Warrior really has done well resonating with people who have read it so far. Mm -hmm. So I think people will really enjoy it. Yeah. Now, as I as I understand it, the Cosmic Warrior very much leans into the sword and planet um, end of science fiction. Um, yeah. Yes. Correct. It's it's set in modern times, so it's not as um, I guess futuristic or past futuristic as as a lot of what we think of in terms of that, but I, I wanted to give that p appeal where you kind of have a human who's transported into a, a, you know, sort of different realm 
mm-hmm. because that's just uh, that's just fun. That's classic science fiction right there. Yeah, and now of co- of course we could we could go into the we could go into how far back the whole normal person getting transported into a, into a strange world go- goes. But um, I'm I'm not that ki- I'm not that kind of historian, <laughs> and I. Right. I um I do not drink I do not drink my tea with a raised pinky. I'll put it that way. Well, it goes back to at least Mark Twain, right? So, um, where how far <laughs> how far it goes back is debatable. Uh, there, does Dante count? Yeah, <laughs> like I like I said, it's very it's very debatable. <laughs> I've I have seen I have seen I've seen some people say the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri um counts. I've seen some people say no. The no, the first, the first was um, through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, um, I, and so and um, so on, and I think it, I think it depends on one thing: one, um, how much how much of a history snob you want to be, and two, how many drugs you're on. Because I refuse to believe that through the Looking Glass was not written while on drugs. It seems like it, definitely. <laughs> Um, but the, the, um, it's a bit, uh, there are, um, there's two, there's two very clear, um, an- analogs that, that are going to come to mind. I'm pretty sure others have brought this, others have brought this up. And if they haven't, I'm very disappointed. Um, that being John Carter of Mars or the Barsoom saga and Buck Rogers, were, the, were those two yeah, the, those, those are things I definitely wanted to channel through this. Um, so Buck Rogers, I didn't really go so much into uh, that. I, I would say Overmind, my next one, will will have a little bit more of that feel than this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I definitely wanted to present John Carter. I mean, it's definitely a, that's a trope I like to use very often with the whole Princess of Mars thing. I use that for Dave's Volt, too. Mm-hmm. Where you know uh, you get transported into another world, you have to kind of fight your way through that world, uh, and then you kind of wake up back here. Now, the Cosmic Warrior does not wake up back here. Mm-hmm. Is going to be the difference. Uh, I wanted to present this uh, as kind of an ongoing superhero thing, right? So you get uh, you get the powers bestowed upon him. He's fighting these cosmic battles, and then you know once he has those powers and he's established, he can go and fight other cosmic power uh, battles. Is the thought? Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, I, I wanted to. Sp- create a superhero universe that felt a lot like 70s Marvel, 80s Marvel, 70s and 80s DC, you know, back when it was like straight heroic adventure where, you know, you know that it's just going to be a big action romp and uh, none of the like, you know, sitting around and uh, whining in the Batcave about, you know, I can't do any good. You know, I don't, I'm sick of, I'm sick of that kind of introspective deconstructed hero. Uh, so I wanted to bring it back. I wanted the strong male lead back. I just wanted just just pure action back. Mm-hmm. I wanted somebody who's going to rise to a challenge and just fight, and uh, and that's what we did with the Cosmic Warrior. Yeah. Now, um, speak speaking of speaking of that, since since you since you brought up John, since you brought up John Carter, one of the um, one of the more contentious and debatable things with um with John with John Carter over the years has been has been the whole how he even how he even gets to um, Mars. I mean, I think the, um, sometimes as a kid, a lot of, a lot of stories end up hand waving away, hand waving that away be- in favor of the whole he's on Mars thing. Some of them, t- some of them take the route of, pro- of astral projection in a cave and some get weirder, <laughs> Dep- depending on, depending on which, depending on which version you're looking at. Um, but, and then it's kind of ambiguous. I mean, did he dream the experience? Who knows? You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of, a lot of not explained there. And I think our, um, I think our culture's gotten a little too far into explaining things. Like back in early science fiction, you didn't have to explain everything. Uh, how did he is, how does the cosmic warrior's powers work and all that? How did, uh, what, what's this mysterious force? No, the aliens just had a force and they just gave it to him. And then he has powers. You don't have to know anything beyond that. And uh, that allows, one, a reader to kind of imagine their own way of it happening. Mm. And two, uh, you know, it just leaves it so that there's a little bit more mystery involved. 
there's a little bit more of uh, adventure involved, and that gives that whole sense of wonder to it. Mm -hmm. So I think over-explaining things has become a problem with modern science fiction, where everything has to be realistic and in this box, and uh, I, that's not what science fiction's about. I remember, um, I remember, I remember the time a while back when I had the Clan Finn on, and I think I brought this up with you in the past, but he, but he coined the term "large men with screwdrivers." Um, I'm not sure if he coined that term, but I've, I've heard that around our circles, definitely. I don't, I'm not gonna, uh, and yeah, that's that's the thing. I can't say um, I'm not going to definitively say that he coined it, but but I first heard it, I first heard it from him. And there is I I look at it I look at that kind I look at the explanation paradox as um, a bit of a pendulum, because if you explain too little, um, you're gonna have you're gonna have a very lost audience. Um, Especially if you, especially if you um, don't explain the things that need to, but you leave the wrong things ambiguous. Um, at the same time, you can you can go you can go too far in the other direction and end up fl and end up um, flattening your universe. Um, it's the reason why I think I think to use a bit of an to use a bit of an example of explaining the wrong things. I um, as I got older, I I kind of began to understand why why some people took it why some people took issue with the within the um Tim Burton Batman that um that the jo that the man who would become the Joker was the same man who ki who killed Bruce's parents right yeah it uh that's well that's that's creating a twist it's a little different than not explaining things or explaining things that 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 scenario is creating trying too hard to create a twist and then it kind of flying in the face of lore that is kind of established so people are like wait a minute this isn't this to, this is too coincidental and doesn't work mm -hmm. right so uh you know that's kind of a different situation yeah there's there's definitely times where you can get a reader lost and uh you try to avoid that in comics again by having a straightforward story so I think uh, I, I think we accomplished that, uh, you know, the straightforward story to where it's very easy to follow um, has always been my goal uh, with with my comics, uh, especially. And it, it seems to be like that's kind of what you got in the 50s, 60s and 70s in comics was you could pick up an issue, you could read it, you could understand what's happening, you could put it down. And I want to make sure our readers get that same experience. Yeah. Now, within within that when it comes to when it came to the other um the other thing that you had noted on the Indiegogo page, which bring which brings me to an interesting question, give, given given the subject matter, is Green Lantern. Yeah, I say that because uh, it's kind of an exploring in space cosmic sort of thing, and mm -hmm. uh, I think nothing really does that better than uh, Green Lantern. I mean, Green Lantern really goes off into space, fights spatial threats, fights threats to Earth. Uh, you know, uh, engages himself kind of as the police of the galaxy. And uh, the Cosmic Warrior kind of thrusts himself into a similar situation. Now, he's more uh, asked to be a champion uh, to actually fight on behalf of this alien species. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different. Uh, there's no, there's no like, guardians controlling him or anything like that. It, it's completely his agency and there's, his morality doing no, it. There's no, uh, but that's what I wanted to do. There's no, there's no huge organiza organization that he's a part of that he, that is that he's answerable to. No, none of that. It's it's very much like a solo. It's a solo thing where you know he's he's got his power and he's going off on the cosmic threats. You know, it's similar to like you know the Silver Surfer does very similar. Uh, I would say mm -hmm. uh, in in those old books too. Uh, characters like Nova from Marvel. Some stuff like that, you know, that you just really don't get anymore. I mean, I really enjoyed those cosmic stories. I love Jim Starlin's work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love what Jeff Johns and Ethan Van Skyver, of course, did on uh, the Green Lantern. And, uh, you know, that that's the kind of feel I want to capture again. Yeah. And, well, Je despite, despite, his, despite his issues on the film end of things, and no disrespect to the guy, some, some, people, just, some people just can't translate between mediums. Um, Jeff Johns has always been very, very good at, cre at creating at creating a good, fun popcorn flick. Um, it's just it's just that he has a it's just that he has a couple he has a couple bad habits that kind of hold him back. One of them being keep him away from Wonder Woman, and and the other being um the retcon drinking game. 
The retcon drinking game. What's that? He has a Jeff Johns has had a bad habit for years of um of of adding retcons and then retconning his own retcon. Um, and when when it comes to when it comes to, but the bigger thing is uh, is the whole keep him away from Wonder Woman because he he can do even though his stories have have certain flaws he can still hold his own um fairly well except when he's writing Wonder Woman for some reason I don't know I don't know why but any time he tries to write Wonder Woman he tries to write her as Miss Perfect which doesn't fit. Yeah, it depends. I've, I've read a lot of Wonder Woman actually recently. Uh, so I guess a little bit off topic, but uh, I mean, I don't know. Something something about DC, like they just can't keep their continuity straight and they retcon everything. It's not just Wonder Woman. It's just like they, they can't even handle like just like keeping Superman, uh, you know, on track. And uh, that's what bothers me a lot about these big companies. And really why I want to start my own comics of my own property so I could have superheroes that they actually progress they actually do their thing. They, I, they, you don't have to worry that I'm going to reset the universe and reboot everything every three, four years. Uh, the stories are going to be valid, and they're going to continue to be valid as I grow things. Now, as I get, I'm becoming a better writer, obviously, uh, as I keep going along. Uh, at least I hope I do. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, there's some there's some choices I, I wish I hadn't made in the past, but um, I'm going to live with those. If I kill a character or whatever, I'm going to live with that choice. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to try to just like uh magically uh reboot the universe my way out of it or anything like that i, th I think that kind of thing really insults the readership and insults the customers and uh you know i want to give people an experience that they're investing money and time and you know their brain power into reading my books and all that uh i want to give something that they can know that it was kind of worthwhile and yeah, that story will continue yeah. and uh it's it's you know partially because of their investment too I may have mentioned this um, in, on the previous times I've had you on, but I remember I remember I remember speaking with somebody who was who at the t at the time was doing um, te was was doing direct was doing direct directing work for for a, a TV show, and one of the things that he meant one of the things that he mentioned was the importance of what he called a series bible, um, basically basically one document book or book or what have you that has that it that has ev essentially every single rule that the, that the story ha that the story has to follow in order to remain consistent. All the major details when it comes to plot points, when it comes to characterization, when it comes to relationships, and um, everything with everything within the setting, and so and so on. Um, did you did did you end up subconsciously making making something like that in order to? keep in order to keep your respective stories consistent i have it uh for my steampunk novels because i've got five novels with the content now and that's i mean that's you know 400 plus thousand words so that kind of uh becomes a little more difficult to just keep in your head mm -hmm. obviously it's easier to keep 66 pages of 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 material in, of material in your head right just so exactly. So like with the with even with Flying Sparks, Flying Sparks is my main superhero series, and I think that's twelve issues in at this point with a couple side stories. Uh, every time I go back to write a new issue, I could just read that over, and it you know it takes me a couple hours. So it's you know I mean there's no reason not to just read that over. Now once if if that series and I God bless I hope it does gets into fifty a hundred issues or whatever, um, you know at that point I'm probably going to start you know taking down extra notes about what you know what happened to this issue and this issue etc and have, have like a pretty good timeline mm -hmm. uh right now it's just not necessary because i can i can reread the entire story so fast yeah and this hasn't this hasn't been a problem yet when it comes when it comes to a lot of a lot of in, a lot of indie development because because of the, because of the fact that so many people are do are doing brand new ips at this stage but it is. It does pose an interesting question long long term, in regard in regards to in regards to that whole that whole multiple issue thing. Because you've probably heard this as much as I have, but one of the one of the big one of the big criticisms when it comes to getting into comics is is this is this idea that you have to that you have to have have read all have read all this um, previous material before you can get before you can get into something. 
That is the struggle with comics, but uh, I think you can solve that uh, by kind of having storylines that kind of have clear beginning, middles, and end. I'm, I'm when I started, uh, I was pretty ambitious with Flying Sparks, and I'm like, oh, this can be an ongoing series. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I got into it, and I'm like, well, I should probably really end the arc of what's going on at some point. And I plotted it for 15 issues worth of content, or five volumes is what I ended up doing because I do three issues of volume for pretty much all of my books. Um, and so, uh, that way there's a definitive end. People kind of know where they're going to be at, uh, and they can actually, you know, get through things, uh, at a certain reading spot. Um, now as I got into volume four, people were like, Hey, if you would actually put a recap page, that'd be kind of nice. And, uh, I probably should have done that for volume four. I, <laughs> I, I didn't think of it at the time. I might for volume five, uh, for that series, but the cosmic warrior, this is going to be like, that's, you know, this story beginning, middle end, and it's done, uh, pretty easily. Now there's stuff that I've left open with the character uh, personally and, and professionally uh, so that, you know, somebody could come in on the next one and, and do that. But the next one will be, if, if, if we make enough money to do a second one, mm-hmm. uh, will be uh, about the same to where it's just uh, a good spot. You can just read that story. If you want to go back and read this one, which is kind of his origin, you can do that. Uh, but you definitely don't need to. And I think that's the way to handle it in indie comics is just tell a complete story uh, each time you're going out. And I'm moving much more that direction as I do things. Mm-hmm. Now, when one per, there is one, when, since you mentioned 70s Marvel, there is um, there is one particular one, per, one particular co- one particular comic that lean that leans into the fantastical from from that era that I. I've brought up in the past that I that I happen to be fo- I happen to be fond of, and that, and I'm curious if that was a bit of an influence for this, and that is um, the John Buscema era with um, Savage Sword of Conan. Yes, that uh, that was a big influence on our Dave's Volt, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at that, we we really tried to capture that feel, uh, almost almost perfectly, right? Yeah. Uh, and I I know. Th- since since we since we mentioned the whole power that the whole powers thing with um with with the cosmic warrior um with um in John in John Carter the the whole the whole superhuman af- abilities that he could have was was hand waved as he's on Mars Mars has lower gravity but he's spent his whole li- he's spent his whole life and and especially as a um soldier on um Earth's gravity. But Mars has weaker gravity, so he so he's going to be a lot stronger. Yes. Um. Cosmic Warrior uh, literally gets instu- in- instilled with uh, alien cosmic powers. It's a plot point, so uh, it, it doesn't really have to do with the environment so much as he actually uh, is bestowed powers yeah. uh, by 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 a being. Yes. Now, give, given all that, would you would you say that since you mentioned Green Lantern, would you say that one other? Um, one other particular character that you could draw that you could draw some parallels with, it in that especially when it comes to that cosmic Marvel is say, um, old school Captain Marvel or even or even Adam Warlock. Uh, not yeah, Warlock's Warlock's interesting because he's got just like a very complicated past. Captain Marvel, old school Captain Marvel might fit a little bit better uh, because even though Marvel is an alien, he's still kind of got. A, a little bit more down to earth grounding to him. Um, I'm trying to think of a parallel that works really well. Um, you know, an- another one I like to go to is Exo Manowar because you know you've got a uh, he's got alien armor. Cosmic Warrior doesn't have armor, but he's uh, you know alien armor attaches itself towards Exo Manowar, who's this like kind of barbarian of the past who's fighting his way through things. Yeah, he's you a- know we have we have cosmic powers uh, instilling itself on a. Uh, on a uh, Blue Angels pilot here, mm-hmm. so it's uh you know it there are parallels, but uh, I, I'm hoping I created something unique enough that you can't just point to something and go that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and truth truth be t- truth be told, I, on- I only I only bring up these kind of parallels sim- simply because of, of one, um, I read I read too many bu- I read too many books. That I've, I've already told you how- me too. <laughs> How um how I how I was the, I was that kid who would go, who would go into a bookstore or a library and not come out until until um pe- until past sunset, <laughs> and and 
to the point to the point where the to the point where the librarian just gave me a spare set of keys because I was in there so much. <laughs> nice. Like the I would go in there, I would go into the place at at 10 a, at 10 a.m. and I wouldn't I wouldn't leave I wouldn't leave until 9:30 p.m. That's how long that's how long it went. Good for you. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the reason why my head is so f is so full of this kind of thing. So, and there and there's also the fact that artists artists and writers do not create in a vacuum. Right. Um, you you and I always I always I have always found the chain of inspiration to be in, to be interesting. Um, Definitely, we always draw from what whatever we read, right? So. Um, you know, or what we see on TV, or we'll play video games up, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we draw from what we've seen, uh, and and we either, we don't always do it consciously, uh, but we also draw from it in another way, which is like if we don't like something, we sit there and go, "I don't want to do that," mm -hmm. right? And uh, and so I think there's an equal amount of that in kind of what I'm doing now because I've just watched how comics have gone in the mainstream industry over the last five, ten years, and just what a train wreck. Uh, they've been, uh, and just how it's been riddled with identity politics. It's been just riddled with just like knockoff cheap replacements with gimmicks. Mm -hmm. And I sit there and I go, I don't want to do that. I just want to have a story that's a straightforward story where a guy can become a hero. He can beat up some freaking monsters mm -hmm. and he can go home happy. You know, that, that seems to be something lost. Like people don't write that anymore. I mean, a few do. But in Marvel and DC, you certainly don't get that, and that's that's what made us fall in love with comics to begin with, right? Those, you know, seeing Spider-Man go up against Doctor Octopus against all odds, he's having a hard time. His Aunt May is sick in the hospital, and she's going to die if he doesn't get him medicine right away. And he doesn't have the money to buy the medicine, uh, and and he just overcomes it somehow because he works his freaking tail off uh, despite off every despite everything. Uh, that's the type of thing I, that that feels good. It's not it's not this like uh, deconstruction that everybody does yeah. these days where they're they're trying too hard to find their spin on things. Uh, you know, the hero's journey works. The coming of age story works. Mm -hmm. The Horatio Alger story, uh, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstrap, it, it works. And uh, those are types of things that hold true uh, in general mm -hmm. and uh, and are also just good things to try to morally teach people also. It's, fun it's funny that you bring up something like deconstruction when I've had a bit of a micro series in my own podcast that we call reconstructing. Um, nice. <laughs> the short the short version is t is t is taking missed opportunities, using using what's present, recontextualizing as much as we can, and try and and try and um, well reconstruct it. We we started with the Star Wars sequels, and we've done a few other things since. Um, but. I just, whenever whenever I whenever I look at um at so at that ki at that kind of sword and planets um approach the other th the other thing that I that I always end up thinking of and this might be a bit of an odd an odd mention is some is the is the first wave of um of pro of progressive rock mm -hmm. um I'm talk I'm talking think I'm talking like I'm talking like like um, Earth is an example of this kind of thing. Um, Sun is debatably an example of it, although it gets although they go more horror themed. Um, a lot of stuff that would that later on would become kind of the basis for things like stoner metal, like say the Sword. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with it. Um, yeah, I, th I think one I think one of the ma one of the major reasons is. With a, I, for a lot of people, their introduction to to that sort of progressive style was stuff like um, Iron Butterfly, although although or um, although I although whether or not that would count as a good example is is debatable since that was a one hit wonder within a God of Davida, but <laughs> and it do, it certainly doesn't hurt that there was a um, that several years ago there was a mobile game that. Tried to tried to aim for that for that kind of for that kind of progressive style called um, God of Blades. It's actually the only mobile game I can actively I could actively endorse. Especially since they did a they did a bit of they did a bit of brilliance where they um 
they the, where you could get certain bonuses if you played the game in a library or a bookstore. I'm not familiar with it either. I, I don't really game, and I I don't really listen to old music either. <laughs> well, the the sword's not that old. They've they've they got they got started in the early 2000s. No, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't heard of them. So, um, but he, but even even so, I think one of the one of the one of the other things that um. That very much that very much gives me that sort that very sword and planet vibe is is the is the fact that once you once you put aside the whole uh, the whole other planet thing a lar a large amount of a large amount of what I'm seeing when it comes to the co when it comes to the cosmic warrior is not too far removed from that from that kind of um, classical barbarism you would see in sword and sorcery the two of them have been all, have always been joined at the hip in that regard. Yes, um, I agree with that. Uh, I think I think our character is, is more of a uh, he's a modern warrior as he's a he's a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. But what happens is you know he's thrust into the classic arena battle to start the the uh, series, and um, he rises to the challenge. And so uh, he gets dressed in the in the barbarian sort of getup because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's uh, that's really just because he's rising to the challenge. So it's it's interesting uh, that I'm actually creating a juxtaposition between you know the modern warrior and that uh, with the character. Uh, that's that's you know I, again I, I hopefully a little bit of a different take on things. Oh yeah. Now, I now um, when it comes now the the uh, art the art for the art forward was was handled by um Clovis Rodriguez and colors by Levy Ramirez how did you how did you end up meeting up with those two uh Cloves, uh I don't I don't remember how I found him gosh <laughs> um I think I think I was like putting out a call for just general artists and he responded as one of many and I was like okay well I I've seen you've actually done he's actually done dozens of comics and i'm like well i see you've got a bunch you get a lot of uh, people who respond to comic art calls and they're like oh i've drawn a few pinups or whatever and, and a lot of times they're very pre pretty pinups and things like that uh but it takes a certain kind of person who can do that visual sequential storytelling uh it's a very different thing than a pretty figure in a pinup or whatnot mm -hmm. and uh i try to avoid people who do not have a lot of experience in that uh one because sequential storytelling takes a long time and with a lot of pages uh, and somebody I want to work with uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, I don't want to have to like lose my artist halfway through a story, which I've, which has happened a few times to me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he could do that. He'd, he'd been working on this one Martian story with somebody else science fiction wise also. So that fit, uh, you know, for I think 15, 16 issues. And so I'm like, great. Uh, this is somebody good I can work with. Love you, Ramirez uh, was recommended to me by somebody. Uh, I was uh, needing a new colors for Flying Sparks. Um, I, uh, my second colorist uh, got way too busy and, uh, and started working with Xenoscope almost exclusively. So I had, to, I had to kind of pivot and find somebody else. And he stepped up and did a pretty good job there, too. So, uh, that's, that's, uh, so he came from Flying Sparks, and uh, I'd worked with him on several issues before this. Uh, so it was, it was kind of neat. I watched Cloves. Cloves actually turned in these issues very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very diligent. Uh, he's he's a, he's a good worker, and uh, it was nice working with him because of that. And uh, getting the colors that are you know already kind of my standard on top of that worked really well. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> when it comes, when it now um obviously obviously this is obviously this is. This is the this is the thir this is the fourth this is the fourth um ro fourth rodeo give give or take, um when it comes to when it comes when it comes to you delving into comic creation, um, uh, it's more than that. This is my eleventh <laughs> crowdfund. So and I've got I've got Flying Sparks. I've got Days Volt. I've got uh, I, I had Dynamite Thor, Robo Toad, mm -hmm. um. Clockwork Dancer, AI Wars, um, and then Cosmic Warriors. So this would be like my seventh 
line, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, not counting not counting short comics. Oh. So uh, yeah, it's I I have so many ideas. That's that's my big marketing problem for the people who are listening. I just like I can't stick with my just one thing. I just got I got to keep like rolling different ideas all the time because it's just my head's just bursting at the seams with them. But yeah. Um, what I, what I was going to ask in in regard to that is, venture um. When it came to when it came to when it came to venturing between um, writing no, writing novels and writing um, comics, um, if you what were what were some of the lessons you had to learn but you had to learn by by experience in the in the process of doing the, doing all of those comics? Um, comics, I had to dial down talking scenes a little bit uh, because novels really rely on talking scenes a lot, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the characters kind of getting information from each other that way comics being visual you want to have as little of those as possible uh you really want to keep things moving and keep all the figures moving uh, as, as best you can now a lot of again mo- modern comic comics have stopped doing that and i think it's to the detriment of uh, comics in general I, I i get i i just read a book probably a couple days ago where it's like three four pages of just the two characters talking to each other just talk back and forth two characters that is not visually interesting to look at at all, uh, and so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, and I, you know, probably my early Flying Sparks issues, I wasn't quite as good on that. Um, and then uh, the the good thing about comics though, is again, you just get the stories out faster. Um, so uh, I would say the next thing you you learn is is the pacing, uh, and that's between panels and pages and all that too. So uh, not not just like the dialogue and the way that that's all going. But, you know, I, I try to tell a comic in a certain amount of pages. Like, I try to do 66 pages a book. So that means I got to lay things out to, like, where I have to have the beats hit at certain points uh, so that it flows naturally. Now, a novel, I can kind of just, like, write it until it feels right. It doesn't have a set amount of pages or anything to start. So those are kind of a different ballgame on that level, too. Um, with, and with that, with that, in, with that in mind... Um... When it came to when it came, when it came to handling when it came to handling something like something like um, Sword and Planet, um, was were there were there any were there any because a lot of a lot of because a fair a good a good chunk of what you had done previously was in the was, sir, while while still in the heroic end but a lot a lot of it was still in classical superhero, so. Were there were there anything were there any things that were that um you had to any habits that you had to make sure to not fall into that you could get away with 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 um classical superhero that you can't that you couldn't really do here. Um no I don't think so because uh because this still at the end of the day is kind of a superhero tale. Mm-hmm. Um you know in, in Flying Sparks I had a feminine superhero. Uh, and so I wrote her a little differently because I, I really wanted to make sure her femininity came through and it didn't just end up looking like a dude in a skirt, you know, which is like a lot of modern stuff. It's like, you know, I'm a woman and I'm stronger than any man. It, it just gets really annoying uh, really quickly. So I want to make sure that was not the case with my female superhero. Uh, with the male superhero, I didn't have that limitation. So I would just uh, have him, you know, really just be as aggressive as possible. Uh, and that's kind of the difference between the two characters. It, it was it was refreshing to write because you don't see it that much these days. Yeah. Now, whenever whenever you're in, whenever um, you're introducing a whole a whole new um, setting, one of the one of the important things is to, is make is making sure that making sure that there is a set that there is a set of consistent rules um, with, within that within that world. Is is that something when you were con- when you were concepting the cosmic warrior that you um, had that you had in mind? If not if not in full on notes, just in the back of your head while writing. Yeah, I have my flying sparks world, and I do uh, consider this to be in the same world, right? Um, so uh, I did set them in different places. The flying sparks is set in Los Angeles, and then the cosmic warrior starts out in San Francisco before he's transported to another planet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I definitely wanted to make sure that like people know superheroes exist because that exists in Flying Sparks, uh, you know, little things like that. Uh, 
you know, they're they're not they're not going to be surprised by seeing it, even though it's it's still kind of a rare thing. Uh, it's not not like Marvel Universe where everybody's a freaking hero at this point. Um, so that exists setting wise, mm -hmm. um, and there's there's there is a, a government agency that deals with heroes in the setting too. It doesn't come up in this volume of the Cosmic Warriors. Uh, you know, again, if if we go further with it, uh, those things might come into play and some crossover stuff might come into play also, but I, I've, I've definitely kept that in mind uh, when doing this. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, with that in mind, I know, I know that you, um, that you, that you end up, you end up doing turnout fa fairly, qu fairly quickly, but two, two things. One, um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? I know there's only um, eight days left on the, on the um, Indiegogo. And two, and two. What start? What started the whole thing of having you signing each volume? Uh, somebody requested it. There are actually multiple people who requested it on Dave's Fold. Uh, and I figured since I'm doing a quick campaign, uh, I'm not going to get overwhelmed with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially since it's one again, a lot of people have already read this book, so it's like uh, I'm really reaching out to new people rather than uh, a lot of people who have already bought this book. Uh, and so I figured it. it kind of just be easy to do. That's <laughs> what it came down to. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if my customers want something and they request it of me, I try to keep them happy as best as I possibly can. Uh, I think the whole point is to be customer first. I think customer service is important. I think that's something the mainstream comic industry does not provide. So, you know, if there's something reasonable and somebody's like, you know, four or five people reached out to me and are like, I, I, I wish you would assign these books for days full. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I'll do it on the next one for you guys, right? Uh, and so that's, that's going to be... Uh, it's going to be it. And if people want, you know, X or Y, you know, I'm going to try to incorporate that in, uh, you know, it, it reasonably. I mean, if somebody tells me to write a story or whatever, and it's their story, I'm going to be like, well, I got my own story. But, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I'll do what I can for the customers always. Yeah. And with the, with that with that in with that in mind, um, I know, I know that I know that this is that this is a that this is a collected vert version of of something that had previously been been written but in if you um looking back looking back in looking back in hindsight with um the cosmic warrior on it on its own um were there in were there any were there any um lessons that you felt that you felt you had learned from um from your from your first foray into sword and planet um let me think about that um Probably. Uh, there, there's a couple story points. Uh, I don't want to give away too much about it, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that, that beyond yes. I, I, there's a couple points I definitely took away from this, which I'll, I'll think about for future volumes. Uh, there's a, there, were, there were a couple dialogue parts in the first, in the uh, single issue versions uh, where uh, I didn't like the dialogue, so I'm actually changing it for the collected edition. It's not going to change the story at all, but I just like I phrased some things a couple kind of badly in a couple spots. Uh, so I'm going to fix that, right? Uh, that's the beauty of being able to go back and do something like this and do a new version of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, that's the ex that's the extent. Without spoiling things uh, for the for the book, that's the extent of what I can say about it. Yeah, I'm, obviously, I, w I wasn't going to ask for um, spoilers in that regard. It's just it's just every um, every project there's always an opportunity to learn because. Um, nobody bats a thousand, obviously. Um, especially, especially, no, especially now that everybody cracks that every athletic commission cracks down on PEDs. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and I uh, I try to get better with every release. I think that's that's important to just keep improving, uh, keep listening to the readership for what they want, and and try to provide more of what the readers want. I mean, that's that's definitely always the goal. Mm -hmm. And. I will. I will certainly. Keep, I will certainly be keeping a close eye on how it on how it on how it develops, and see and seeing what and and seeing where where this kind where this kind of thing comes, as well as the fact that I think I deserve some credit for the fact that I went through this entire interview and didn't make one Freddie Mercury reference. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty. You I'm just pretty, did though. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I just did. So I kind of <laughs> broke that, and now, and but if if that if that means that the theme from Flash Gordon is is um stu is stuck in the is stuck in the heads of whoever is going to be listening to this, you're welcome. 
and I regret and I apologize for nothing. Look, if I'm gonna nice. get, if I'm gonna get some if I'm gonna get a song stuck in somebody's head, it may as well be a good song. They're gonna be bombarded with spooky music that this month, and in a couple of months they're gonna be bombarded with holiday music. So, may as well um, soften the blow while I can. That is coming up. We're in pumpkin spice season now. Yeah, or as I, as I like as I like to call it, holiday hell, because I because I have friends in the Philippines who are already doing the Christmas who have already been doing the Christmas stuff for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Like, I love you guys, but um, lay lay off of the Christmas shit. Sure. Really. It is. They started that. They started that crap in September. And it go and it goes it goes all the way through February. Crazy. Yes. But with all, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come on to the sh come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Um. And just, as always, as always, anytime you see fit to to return to these hallowed halls, the door is always open. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. We like to call it the we like to call it the um the LA Do the incompetence of LA Dodgers support group. Among uh, among other nice. Things. <laughs> it's, a mon it's a Monday night as we're doing this, so I'm I'm trying not to tonight. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>